Welcome to the Rock is George podcast. I'm your host, George Dion, and this is episode 62. Thank you for tuning in to the Rock is George podcast on one of the many podcasting platforms that we appear on YouTube through our website, rockisgeorge.com or at knac.com. My guest for this episode is John Elefante. He has a new album out through Deco Entertainment. It's called The Amazing Grace. John Elefante broke on to the music scene back in 1981 when he auditioned to replace Steve Walsh in the progressive rock band Kansas. He went on to record two full-length albums with them, 1982's Vinyl Confessions and 1983's Drastic Measures. A song that he wrote, Play the Game Tonight, from Vinyl Confessions, went to number four on the charts, and Fight Fire with Fire went to number three on the charts off of Drastic Measures. From there, John went on to form a band with his brother Dino called Mastodon, which is a highly regarded band in the AOR and melodic rock circles. I highly recommend checking them out. He's released several solo albums over the years. In addition to owning one of the largest recording studios, Sound Kitchen Studios, and having his own label, Pachyderm Records and Selectric Records, John's kept himself busy on the microphone as well as behind the boards as a producer for such acts as Petra, X Sinner, Baron Cross, Guardian, and many, many, many more. His new album, The Amazing Grace, is a fantastic slice of AOR and melodic rock, in my opinion. But rather than me tell you all about it, here's John Elefante. If I knew absolutely nothing about John Elefante, how would you describe your music to me? I like to say it's thought provoking lyrically. I like to say it's kind of adventurous musically. It's not real structured as an ABC pop song. I'm not real, I shouldn't say keen, but I'm not real worried about singles per se. You know, I kind of still pride myself after the old AOR. And I'm sure you know what that is. That's what I like to do. But, you know, some of my stuff is very accessible too. So. Absolutely. And your latest album is The Amazing Grace. It was released on Deco Entertainment. It's been almost 10 years since your last solo album. Was there something holding that up? I've uh, been doing a lot of live shows. Sometimes I'll be gone for three or four days and come home and just not want to go near my studio. But to tell you the truth, I, I don't know where that 10 years went. Man. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> you know, it's when they say time flies, boy, is that an understatement? Understandable. So, with The Amazing Grace, it's not so much a concept album, but I, at least what I hear in it, there is a continuing theme of faith and mortality and life and death. Is Am I on to something there? Am I way off? No I, no, I think you are. But what I really try hard not to do is preach at anybody or put down anybody else's beliefs. I, I like to, I like to, my lyrics to be autobiographical, just about experiences that I've been through in my life and trials and tribulations that I've personally been through because that's what I know best. I know what I've been through and, you know, in my life. And uh, I think I'm probably most well-versed in that and just that. I mean, I I don't, I don't claim to get inside anybody else's head and and, um, jostle their beliefs. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about uh, a couple of the singles since they were personal experiences of yours. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about stronger now and kind of, what story you're trying to tell there? You know, what's stronger now was written during the pandemic, right in the heart of the pandemic. The guy who I co-wrote the lyric with, my, my friend, um, we didn't want to project a negative light over the whole thing because, you know, let's face it, man, the pandemic and COVID was just like, an, it, was, it was unknown. We didn't know what was going to happen. Was it going to kill everybody? You know, I mean, some of my friends were dying and, and, you know, it was very, very scary. You know, we wanted to project the positive message. And in the song Stronger Now, you know, I, I said, look, man, if we get through this, we're going to come out the other side stronger. If, if we can get through something this serious and this heavy, we're going to come out the other side of this thing stronger. Do you want to talk a little bit about Won't Fade Away? That's your other single from the album. Yeah, that was the la- you know what? That was the last song. I, I actually caught COVID myself. That was the last song that I sang on the record. No, not not the last, the second to last song I sang because I couldn't sing for two and a half months. I mean, I was over COVID, but it really affected my voice. I, I, I couldn't get up into my high range. So I had to put that one off and put it off and put it off. Now, now that I'm you know, about three months removed from it, 
I'm trying to rekindle what I was thinking when we wrote that. Oh, it, it, you know, it's just the theme of, I want something solid. I want something that's not going to fade away. I, I, I don't want a temporary fix on something. I want something solid that I can hang on to. As you mentioned earlier, that's where my faith comes in. I, and I believe that, you know, I believe that, that God truly is something that you can hang on to that's rock solid. I wish I had a better answer for you. No, hey, I, that, that, that's, that's perfect. Uh, I had an experience with COVID myself and, you know, I was in the hospital for two weeks and, Sorry. you know, it was the pneumonia had taken over my lungs and I was there in the mirror and I was asking for God to save me and God to help me because it didn't seem like the staff was going to help me. And the next day, well, I've, I've heard that story before. I, the, ne <laughs> the next day, a staff member came in and they looked a little deep into what was going on with me and they got me on to the next level, which eventually got me home. That's great. I'm, I'm glad you're here. So, I mean, there's there's all these stories of, of, of you know, God's work all around us. And, you know, it's I, I, it makes some people uncomfortable, but I think the more that we're able to talk about it, the more I think comfortable people are that are, you know, uh, worried about speaking out of turn in some way well i, I don't mean to veer i don't need to veer off but it's i i've heard people say you know when they're when they're talking about the gospel can something you and i and everything else can something be made from nothing and almost nobody can answer that song well sure it can well explain that <laughs> I've yet to hear anybody explain, uh, ha have an answer to that question. You know, when somebody says, well, I'm an, I'm an atheist, I'm a complete atheist. That's when you have to ask the question, well, can something be made from nothing? And the atheist just sits there, you know, perplexed. Um, that's a good question. <laughs> but anyway, we can move on. You have this powerful song that pretty much runs through the entire album from beginning to middle to end, The Amazing Grace, The City of Grace. It's, right. it's such a powerful song if you want to talk about kind of the three parts of it and how it ties in. I've been shown so much grace in my life. I mean, I've been through a lot of really tough circumstances and um, just being in the rock and roll business is tough enough. <laughs> I remember the days when we used to just throw the equipment in, a, in the back of a van, you know, with a six pack. And just go out and have a lot of fun. <laughs> so, but anyway, I, you know, I've, I've been through a lot of tough circumstances in my life, and I've been I've been shown a lot of grace. And I, I think, you know, grace is a wonderful thing, man. When when you think of something bad's going to happen, you know, it's just God will sometimes just show you grace and 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 get you through it. You know, I think it's just it's an amazing thing. It's 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 underrated in my opinion. And you know, we wanted to sing about it, and, and you know, it's not. The song, as you said, is not amazing grace. It has nothing to do with the with the old hymn. It's the amazing grace, because that theme does run so solid through the through, through the entire record. We wanted the, the title track to be the amazing grace. You mentioned, you know, being in a rock and roll band and 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 your faith and this kind of message and stuff like that. Did you, do you face a lot of obstacles with with getting your material out there with this kind of message? Not really. I, it's in, in in a very strange way. I have I've held on to a lot of my secular audience, people that have followed me since Kansas, and what I've noticed about these people, and then you know, there's quite a few of them uh, in Europe, both Europe and North America, that a lot of them don't agree with what I'm singing about, but they like it so much they don't care. They they listen to it anyway. I've gotten that message a lot. And then I've gotten message, you know, messages from people that do like my message and they look forward to it. You know, I also have a, long, a strong Christian market following. And that started way back when I was with Kansas, you know, because Kerry Livgren, you know, was, had a strong faith and Dave Hope and Phil Lee Hart. And so it kind of started way back then, you know, kind of just stayed with me uh, song wise and, and, uh, and lyric wise. Was there something about Deco Entertainment that uh, you were drawn to to get the album out? Because a lot of artists can release their stuff on their own these days. I want a, more of an official release. And I like the guys at Deco a whole lot. I mean, Charlie Calvin, those guys. You know, I, I, I didn't mind splitting the profits with them because I, I think that uh, 
they can do far more than I can do on my own. Um, it's hard to be your own, shipping your own CDs out of your basement these days. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't want to get into that. And um, they're doing a good job, actually. Excellent. They are, actually. I, I probably talk to every artist on the label at this point. So uh, it's certainly stuff that I'm digging and probably people in my age bracket. You're probably younger than me. Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> I'm in my I'm in my mid forties. I'm in my yeah I'm I'm just I just got there forty six. You just got there, perfect. Uh huh. You were on a little tour in the spring. Uh, were you out there promoting Amazing Grace, or do you do like a best of set? No, uh, we haven't toured Amazing Grace at all yet. We're we're waiting. It's kind of a wait and see right now. Before before we set up like mini tours or maybe just one offs. What I've been doing a lot is actually it's been a lot of fun. I go out with a band called Voices of Rock Radio and a very common thing that a lot of people are doing right now. I also go out with John Payne from Asia and, you know, I might go out, I was with Lou Graham last weekend and we all use the same band and there'll be three, sometimes four featured artists that'll do four or five of their hits. So you get to see Kansas and you get to see Journey with Steve Ajeri and you get to see Mickey Thomas Starship and you get to see I'm naming some of the people that I play with Lou Graham, Foreigner, you know, the classic, you know, um, Jason Chef, Chicago. And rather than, you know, sometimes somebody will hire a, a, a big name band and they'll pay a lot of money for them, which is great. And they might play two or three hits and the rest of the songs nobody's ever heard. So I, I think this thing packed full of hits for, you know, two hours is, is really a cool concept. We do a lot of, a lot of corporate shows. And these people just eat it up because, you know, that that average age is between 45 and 65, you know, and they've they know every song. You were a producer and you may still be a producer that I don't know of. Have you been working on any production uh, music? Yeah, yeah, I'm doing some, I'm doing some stuff. I'm, I'm doing some I'm not producing nearly as much as I used to. I like to say that, you know, when Pro Tools became very, very affordable, everybody's now a producer. And, you know, and, and in their defense, there's no budgets. I mean, there really aren't any budgets. I mean, back in the day when I was producing, when my brother and I were producing, you know, well, we, we actually produced over 100 records. I mean, we were getting budgets anywhere from seventy five to $150,000 because studios were expensive and, you know, everything was more expensive. But when, when technology came way, way down in price, People sort of saying, wait, I can go home and do my vocals. I don't need to spend 1200 bucks a day to be in a big box studio. You know, we owned, I don't know if you know this or not, but we owned one of the largest studios in, in the country. Sound Kitchen? The Sound Kitchen. You had seven rooms under one roof. And boy, it was wildly, <clears throat> wildly successful. I mean, Springsteen, The Rising, Faith Hill, Bon Jovi, Julio Iglesias. I mean, you name it. And we started losing our overdub business. And we'd see, we'd see some of our overdub studios just sit dormant, you know, during the week. And it was like, I told my brother, we, we better get out while we can, man, because this, this is not going to get any better. Technology, what we used to have a million and a half dollars invested in one room, today, as I sit here, you could probably do for $15,000. I believe that. It's true. <laughs> I mean, I, I know it's true because I have it in my own basement. Well, I think that, you know, sort of the trade-off of that is that you can reach a, a, a more specific audience today where the industry targeted what they thought was popular as far as music and, and whatnot. And today you can find that focus audience, whether it's here in the United States, probably not so much, but in Europe and countries like that you can target directly to your fans and interact with your fans. True. Very true. There's, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, it, it's actually a good time for, for, for young bands. I mean, there's a, gosh, there's a lot of ways that they can get their music out. I mean, you don't even have to have a record deal to get on Spotify or iTunes or, you know, I see these guys on YouTube without record deals that are getting 25 million hits, you know? Yeah, that equals money and YouTube views and stuff like that. I don't understand how it works, but I mean, it's it's a revenue stream that they've kind of gone around the business, if there even is still a business. Well, the, the business is 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 um, 
a lot of it's live these days. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's where most of the major bands are making their money. And back in the early days, it was you, you played live to sell the album. And today you sell the album to get people to the show. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Very true. Um, you worked with a lot of Christian hard rock bands, metal bands. You won awards working with Petra and you worked with X Center and Baron Cross and Guardian. That was kind of a genre that was was popular, but kind of I, I don't I don't think it really survived to today. And that's a shame. I mean, you still have Striper out there going around, but it, it seems like they're the the last in a line for at least that hard rock metal version. Well, it kind of went out with the hair band. It was it was I mean, it was fun. I mean, we 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 had a record company called Pachyderm Records, and we had we had quite a bit of success. Do you work with any Christian bands today? Whether the ones that are on K Love or on Christian rock stations or stuff not like really that? No, no because it, it's Christian radio has become all it's really just praise and worship music. You know, I wouldn't I wouldn't say my music is is praise and worship at all. I think it's it's a, it's a it's almost like a pop prog rock sound with a inspirational lyric i mean it's uh, i wouldn't call it praise and worship music that's true that, right. that, that's what that's what radio is playing i mean it sounds it kind of sounds like the music that i hear in church on sunday morning not that that's bad no i i, I agree with you my my wife is a big k-love fan and i'm like i swear i just heard this song can we get something <laughs> that that has a good message but is about something else the singers sound a lot alike don't they yeah, they do with the auto tune and their little rap cadence and stuff like that, and country cadence. And I, I gotta agree right. with that. Yeah, there's there's some good ones. Yes, absolutely. I saw Casting Crowns live; they were fantastic. I'll bet. Uh, you had another band called Mastodon with your brother Dino. Are you doing anything with Mastodon? We're gonna do another Mastodon record. It's just in the talking stages right now. That I mean, that's those records have really, really aged well. I mean, I've seen them on eBay for as much as two hundred dollars. Very popular in Europe. Every interview I do over in the UK, everybody talks about Mastodon. Japan, those records were really a hit. And what we did is it—it it wasn't really a band per se that was ever planned on touring. It was like an Alan Parsons project where Dino and I used a lot of the songs that were supposed to go on my solo record that wasn't being made at the time. And we would record the songs and, and, and just bring in the best players that we knew, best guitar players, best singers, you know, best this and that. And uh, Dave Amato from REO Speedwagon sang a lot of it. He, he took over for Gary Richrath. He's been with REO about 35 years now. He was a big part of it. David Pack from Ambrosia. It was, it was just just a plethora of great musicians and singers and good songs. I mean, I don't think there's a, a week that goes by that I don't at least get one or two emails about it. Hey, where, you know, where, where can I pick up this, you know, where can I get this, this CD or that CD or, or LP for that matter? By the, by the way, we are coming out with an LP on The Amazing Grace. I was getting there. Uh, definitely, you got the whole 80s packaging with at least the hard copy and the digital release. I'm like, this would make a perfect vinyl. Well, the only problem with it, though, is they're so backordered. Yeah. I mean, it takes you about seven months to get one made. Are you going to just go with the strict black? Or are you going to go with some funky designs? I don't know yet. Um, I think we'll probably go with a, I think we'll go with a uh, kind of a wild color. Why not? It's kind of crazy how that format's coming back. Oh, it's back. <laughs> it's really back. And, and, and people, I mean, everybody has asked me, you doing an LP, you doing an LP, you doing an LP. As a matter of fact, yes, we are. Are you an LP collector yourself? Uh, yes, I am. I have a media room here in my house that we just built. I bought a really nice turntable and have a really nice sound system in there. And my, me and my 20, my 20 year old son will just go in there and listen to, we love to listen to Dark Side of the Moon, you know, old Super Tramp, Elton John, ELO. We just, just some of the great sounding records, you know, that's just, I mean, when you, when you actually A, B, a LP to a CD, it's disgusting. You know, I mean, CDs are so compressed. What I noticed the most being a singer 
is how large a vocal sounds on an LP. I mean, the vocal sounds really thick and big the way it was recorded. We're on a CD, it gets much, much smaller. But people have gotten so used to it that most people would probably prefer a CD over an LP. But when you have ABM on two good systems and maybe get a, an LP that's not real scratched so you can really hear what's going on, <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's quite a difference. Absolutely. And, so, and, so, and so, for some reason, younger people are getting into LPs, whether, oh, it, totally, totally. whether it's newer artists or older artists. I mean, my 20 year old son can vouch for that. All him and his friends are really in the LPs. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about your time in Kansas, uh, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, you started with them with uh, Vinyl Confessions, and you also appeared on Drastic Measures, which is one of my right. favorite Kansas albums. Uh, was there like nerves coming into this band that was already established and you being a young artist in 1982? You know what? At first, a lot of people ask me that question. At first there was. But once I actually got the gig, I was too busy. I was too busy doing my thing to even think about being nervous. Okay, I got to, you know, I want to learn this song. I'd like to write a couple of songs for this record of, you know, because they were asking me, if you got anything, let's hear it, you know. So I was busy writing. I was busy uh, learning the songs that we were going to have to do on tour. I mean, I was, I was very, so busy that I forgot how nervous I was and um, didn't think about it much. But I'll, I'll tell you, man, that there's one thing that I'm really, uh, I'm really proud of. And, I, you know, just I guess it happened by circumstance. But I was with the original Kansas, all of them, Carrie, Dave, Robbie, Phil, Rich. Other than Steve Walsh, I was with the original band. I was the last singer to be with the original Kansas. And boy, was it exciting. When we'd fire up live, it was like just bigger than life. I don't know who from Kansas is still with us. So I'll ask, are you still friendly with anybody from the original Kansas? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I talked to, I talked to Carrie and Phil all the time. Talked to Rich a little bit. He played on my last record, Rich and David Ragsdale, the violin player. The only two original guys are Phil, the drummer and Rich Williams, the guitar player, but they're still out doing it, man. They're, they're still really good. Do you have any other music projects in the works or kind of penning that next solo album? Oh, we're, with, we're talking about this Mastodon record. Other than that, you know, once I finish the record, it's like, I just like, phew, I'm done with this for a while. <laughs> it's really hard for me to make a record because I'm, you know, I'm writing it, I'm producing it, I'm engineering it, I'm playing on it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just about doing everything. You know, I'll bring in the drummer and a guitar player to do some and bass player to do some stuff. But I mean, I'm, I'm with it from the ground up. So what do you do to relax from this down period of making music? What do you do for fun? Well, I like spending time with my two new grandkids. I have a one year, one year old grandson and a four year old granddaughter. I'm a sports fanatic. Love sports. Right now, you can't go outside. It's 107 heat index today. If I could go outside, I probably would. Where, where do you live, Florida? No, 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 no. I live in uh, just outside of Nashville. So Tennessee Titans fan? You know it. <laughs> Hard to be after that last game, though. Tannehill threw three picks. I, I, I live in Massachusetts, so it's, you know, the multi-time Super Bowl champions, the New England Patriots that everybody hates. I've never heard of them. Are they a new team? <laughs> <laughs> they are now <laughs> pretty much i mean hey they, they did pretty uh, yeah, bill checks a genius man he is probably one of the well, probably the greatest coach of all time i mean i obviously it's objectionable but i mean just look at him i mean he could take a, a nothing roster and bring him to the playoffs at least it's crazy it's crazy what he can do and a man of very few words and doesn't say anything he's probably had a thousand interviews and said nothing yeah exactly <laughs> I'd like to see him loosen up sometime in an interview. Maybe yeah. after he retires, he will. Yeah, I don't know. It'll probably still be the same. He's in Nashville a lot. Is he? Yeah, he's been he's been spotted around town a lot. Oh, uh, here Nashville's nice. It is. You know, downtown is a little crazy for me. Yeah, but uh, out where I live in Brentwood, Tennessee, about twenty minutes south, it's suburbia, man. Very but nice. Certainly got a lot of entertainment coming through Nashville. 
Oh yeah, yeah. They they put up a few new really nice venues. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a lot of places to play. It's good. Do you do any small gigs like that? Just like local stuff, just for fun? Yeah. Sometimes I'll sit in with friends at, at small clubs. They just they'll just ask me, "You want to come sit in for three or four songs?" I say, "Yeah, what the heck." I don't play in Nashville that often. Other than I did a big New Year's party at the Wild Horse. It was on TV. You know, I'll I'll do scattered dates in Nashville, but it's not, uh, you know, you're never a hero in your own town. <laughs> oh, I did do the Grand Prix, though. We did the Nashville Grand Prix, and I sang at that. I think I might be doing it this year, too. Well, that's all I got for you today, John. I had a great time talking to you. The new album, The Amazing Grace, is out now. It's fantastic. A nice little slice of AOR and uh, classic rock there. And uh, I wish you the best of luck with it. Well, thank you very much. I, I appreciate the, uh, I appreciate your time. Once again, I want to thank John Elefante for coming on the Rock is George podcast. Be sure to check out his latest album, The Amazing Grace. Stream it on your favorite streaming music app now. If you like what you hear, make sure and buy a physical copy. Support the artist. For all things John Elefante, check out his website, johnelefante.com. I also would like to thank Brian Mays of Nashville Publicity Group for making this interview possible. You've been great. I've been George Dion. I'll see you again soon.